thank you very much. And uh, thanks for having us here, Misha and colleagues. Um, and I'll jump straight to, to sharing the presentation with you. Uh, yeah, so this is our exciting logo and, uh, and title of our centre, our Sea Centre for Excellence in Plant Success in Nature and Agriculture. And um, yeah, so we, we're sort of spanning the, the, the areas from, from nature to agriculture and I'll, I'll just show you why and uh, give you an overview of, of what we're seeking to achieve in the centre and, uh, and then Daniel uh, and um, Ian will give you some science talks and Daniel will, um, Ian will finish up talking about little linkage, potential linkages to conservation. So I probably don't need to tell this, this group, but you know, plants are used for incredible diversity of purposes in our lives. And of course, in the lives of the other creatures that, that inhabit the earth. Um, used for food, food fibre, fuel, um, pharmaceuticals, you name it, plants are, are really important. And uh, from an agricultural perspective, we need to understand how to limit their effect on the planet. And from a planet's perspective, we want to understand how to keep them as a sustainable contributor. But from a, uh, so this is a part, some slides that we presented to the Australian Research Council in the interview process. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm just giving you a few of those slides today. Um, one of the things that is a big motivator, I think, for a decision-making body like the ARC is, is a plot like this, where we can see the uh, world population uh, over time and the x-axis and up the y, we can see this you know, exponential growth that we've been seeing. Um, which is predicted by, by some to sort of level off, or by most people to sort of level off, uh, at around uh, nine and a half billion um, in sort of 2050. And at the same time, because of the food consumption and all those other purposes that plants are used for, there's being a, sorry, I'll just use my, how do I, um, pointer option, so I'll try and use a pointer. Um, at the same time, we have a decrease in available arable land per person uh, currently, and that's, that's getting worse and worse. And of course, that's bad from any perspective, whether it be uh, available land for, for food production, but also uh, decreasing uh, lands of, with natural populations on them. Uh, next slide. Uh, so from a food perspective, we can look at how the uh, agricultural and uh, organisations have been able to increase the amount of productivity of, of lands that we do use. So this is time here, this is just for wheat and yield in tonnes per hectare. So we've been quite successful in being more productive with the same amount of land. Um, and if we just continue that current trajectory, we end up on this line here. But in order to, to solve that food problem, we actually need to, even if we use uh, more lands, it's predicted that we'll need to double the current rate of genetic gain in order to feed the current populations, a, a current a predicted populations. Um, so how are we going to achieve this double rate of genetic gain when this is the best companies in the world are predicting to only achieve this? That's the really big question that we need to address. On top of this, we have climate change causing heat stress and that's predicted to cause a decrease in the uh, yield of the staple food crops. So we need to solve the problem of increasing genetic gain as well as uh, dealing with the effects of climate change. So the centre's, uh, a large part of the centre is focused on uh, meeting this step change that's required in e increasing the yield in tonnes per hectare, for example, of, of crops. And the other thing that we see is really, really important is to address this emphasis of world food supply on just these three crops, rice, corn and wheat. 
So those three crops produce 66% of the world's calorie intake. So yeah, your, the worldwide calorie intake is coming from just three plants. And I'm sure as a group of conservation biologists, you understand how bad that is for the environment. And so the idea is, is how can we move to more diverse crops? And also how can we address this issue, which comes from reliance on these crops, that 10% of the world's population is undernourished. So you, for example, have people that are obese, but are yet undernourished. So <clears throat> the impediments of a step to a step change are threefold. One is that plants are extremely responsive to the environment. That's really good for plants, but it's not really great for crops because you can't just grow your crop and know exactly what's going to happen to it because the crop will change so much in response to the environment. And this means it's very, very difficult for breeders to predict whether the plants they've grown really are going to be suitable in all the future environments, environments they haven't been able to test them in as well as new climates. Um, the other problem is that we have very little understanding as biologists of the plant as a whole system. So we typically work on different aspects of the plants in isolation. For example, people work on the roots or they work on the shoots and they don't really know how these things really work together to, to control the balance of the plant. And the other problem is that it's very difficult to extrapolate beyond the species of focus. So we don't really have great tools to, to take a, a knowledge from a model system or a well-studied crop system and extrapolate that out to other crops. So the centre seeks to address these three uh, problems, um, or to overcome these three problems through uh, three different aims. The first is to discover and integrate different mechanisms of plant success. So that's looking at how to work as a whole plant, if you like. So instead of having people working on roots and shoots independently, that we actually figure out how to combine that knowledge into one system. One of the major mechanisms that we'll do that through is developing models that will connect those mechanisms and also connect those mechanisms to genomes. And of course, once you've got a model, you can use it for predictions. So we can use it to predict effects in crops and we can also use it to test our understanding of mechanisms. And then the third objective is to innovate the path to crops. So you might have heard of a technology called CRISPR gene technology. Um, that's something that needs to be further um, expanded upon. At the same time, we need to make sure that we develop appropriate laws and that the society is uh, well informed to make decisions about that technology. That are the major areas there. So I've just got some photographs here of the people. The people are obviously the most important part of the centre and the development of these people and the researchers that they work with are one of the most important aspects of, of a centre. So these are the people that work on the, the mechanisms. So connecting all those uh, mechanisms within the plant into an integrated uh, model and so we call them the mechanistic biologists and Ian will be presenting to you today and um, and Daniel. Um, Ian working in the area of diversity of success and Daniel working in the area of um, natural selection and Daniel you might notice that I put a little logo there to celebrate your recent future fellowship. Um, so these people then join together with the modelers um, uh, Mark Cooper, who um, was extremely successful scientist within uh, now DuPont Pioneer Corteva. Um, and yeah, colleagues that are really well known in their ability to use mathematics to understand biology. Some of you probably know Kevin Burridge, um, Diane Donovan here at uh, UQ in maths department, um, Graham Hammer and Barbara Hollands in Tasmania. And then past the crops, uh, Peter Waterhouse is strong in this CRISPR technology. And then we have people that work on, on um, uh, large populations and, and crops, as well as uh, li um, the legal aspects of, of things with Brad Sherman. So 
So the next few slides, I'll just switch gear and talk to you a little bit more about how we're going to achieve this step change. First of all, it's about combining and extending these networks um, that we think about that control the plants. So this is just a diagram. You don't need to look at the details, but you can imagine that if you're thinking about how a plant works, there's lots and lots of, of different bits. Now remember that plants are extremely plastic to the environment. So you need to think about environment, genetics, or some gene networks shown here. Uh, so the challenge when we think about these things as a network is the diversity of the objects within the network and the diversity of the ways that those objects influence each other. So that's one of the challenges of, of building these uh, mechanistic models. Um, and then the other point that, that the centre is looking at addressing is people like Daniel and uh, particularly Ian uh, come up with mathematical models that uh, take correlative studies from across the, uh, the plant kingdom and, and, and try to understand rules of success that are relevant across the plant kingdom. And this is just an example where there's a trade-off between plants that are drought adapted and plants that are nutrient um, adapted in terms of their water use or nitrogen use efficiency. So, and each of these dots and these lines represent um, diverse uh, unrelated um, well, plants from diverse lineages. Um, yeah, so we can try and think about how to bring genetic information and knowledge into addressing uh, this sort of question and how we can use that to help us think about crops and diversity. So how do we uh, do this? Well, there's a, about a third of the sensor is, is mathematics and um, you know, we will be building, if you like, a toolkit of mathematical approaches that enable us to capture information from diverse plants at the genomic level and try to use that to predict uh, relationship between genome and, and phenotype, as well as link mechanisms through biological modelling. And this, uh, is a sort of slightly deeper example to capture a little bit of what Mark would have presented had, had we had time to, to integrate his work. And it's probably a little bit further away from you guys. So I thought well, I'll just integrate it in one slide. But the idea is, is that, you know, crop modeling originated using this infinitesimal model where each gene in the genome contributes uh, a proportion or, or nothing indeed to, to, to yield. And so these are all additive effects. Then, of course, we realise that it's not as simple as that. Of course, there's incredible uh, amount of networks that underlie the relationship from gene to phenome. And one of those things is just simple epistasis. So you combine these two things together, you can have a different relationship now between the summation of all the gene effects and the yield. And then more recently with Graham Hammer, um, They've built models which think about how the different parts of the plant come together to impact on yield. And indeed, some of the work that Ian Wright talks about relates to this sort of modelling. Um, although his is from a, a diversity perspective and this is from a crop perspective. But these are just things like relationships between the amount of light and the amount of plant growth and how that would affect yield. And those models have been very useful for crop predictions. Um, and now we're thinking about how do we actually incorporate genetic models and mechanistic models into that pipeline. And, and so that basically, this diagram here is the, the focus of the centre's contribution to the ag agricultural aspects of um, improving that uh, or creating that step change. Um, so I've mentioned something already about the law, and so that's another um, aspect. And you know, just thinking about time, so I've sped up. So this is my last slide, and it shows the different areas again that we can um, have impact. So firstly, it's in rules of plant success. So this is fundamental biology. Um, our major agricultural focus is in this accelerated rate of genetic gain. 
across using genetic networks to improve um, the rate at which crops can be improved. Uh, policy advice. So this relates to how we might use that, the, the knowledge we're creating um, and the use of, of plants from say indigenous communities um, and how to protect our IP. Um, so all together this should enhance plant industries. And then the, bot the bottom two here might relate to things that you might be interested in. So enhanced decision support can be delivered to agriculture, but possibly also in the area of biodiversity where we might be thinking about conservation. Should we be conserving plants because they look different or because they are genetically different or because they have different mechanisms that regulate their success? That's an interesting question and that's something that the centre could, could work together with others to, to help address. And I'll leave it there and introduce uh, Daniel now, who will tell you about his work on plant adaptation and genetic diversity. And I'll figure out how to stop sharing. Thank you, Christine. Oh. Here we go. Here we All go. right. Thank you, Christine. I'm gonna <clears throat> share my screen now and uh <clears throat> okay so um i'm gonna now give an example of some of the approaches that we are considering uh, experimentally and also in modeling uh, to address uh, how populations uh, follow adaptive trajectories and um the work that is emerging from this one can be considered within the realm of evolutionary systems biology where we not consider only the evolution of one gene or a few genes at a time but we consider the evolution of the entire system as a whole so we're gonna motivate the first one just by this premise which says nature is imperfect i mean like uh, we have an idea that populations might be sitting at an optimum or might be moving towards an optimum and this is depicted here by these adaptive landscape, a metaphor of an adaptive landscape. And as populations climb, they might actually ar arrive close to the optimum, but not necessarily be at the most uh, perfect solution that there might be available. And uh, this presents many problems because uh, our assumption of population at, at an optimum uh, can lead to <clears throat> interpretations of their performance and also lead to interpretations of how to study them or preserve them uh, in different ways relative to where they are af far away from the optimum. So when we think about like this type of uh, optimum uh, solutions, what we're thinking is how a population goes on what we call like an adaptive walk. Each one of those lines up the mountain, you can think of it as a series of mutational steps that allow the population to climb and climb and this could be understood, I mean, from a bacteria in terms of like growth rate to a crop in terms of yield or to a particular uh, uh, tree forest species that increases survivorship and reproduction fertility over time. On the right, you can see one population that got stuck uh, in a particular uh, point of the walk. And, uh, and it's unclear whether that population will remain stuck or will actually go up. And there are different reasons and many reasons by which uh, it's unclear what is going to happen to that population. Now, other populations might be sitting on a ridge or part of the what it was supposed to be an old optimum, but now they're just like traveling without uh, any hope in actually going up. And all the changes that they accumulate are actually effectively phenotypically and selectively neutral. So we have this different types of uh, views as to how solutions that are uh, occurring in nature and evolving in nature are not necessarily the best, right? And one of the major questions that touches upon this and that cuts across many fields is like, <clears throat> is there genetic variation to improve the conformity of such populations and individuals to the environment, right? And from early 1930s, we know that the more genetic variability you have for those traits that matter, the better the response will be of that population. Historically, <clears throat> conservation biology has taken that, for example, as a 
general measure of heterozygosity across the entire genome. And the more heterozygosity you have, the more variability, therefore the greater the chances that the variation that exists for improved conformity also exists. It's a good proxy, but nevertheless, it's like a, a simple proxy that perhaps together with uh, area and population size, et cetera, only capture a fraction of the important uh, variability. So it could be that we could funnel and create bottlenecks of information basically to capture more useful information over time as Christine was saying before. Now, the other thing that is problematic is that if a population is really close to the optimum, the more variation we introduce, the more likely we are to get it off the optimum as well. So the balance between maintaining diversity and keeping solutions is also a very critical one. And uh, we cannot just simply increase diversity uh, blindly, but we also need to know what type of diversity we can increase and what sort of solution we need to preserve. So that's another uh, discussion that needs to be considered when thinking about adaptation. And finally, when we think about these steps over time, uh, what we are considering here is that any one of these walks up the mountain, sort of speak, might include of just one single mutation or many mutations, right? There could be mechanistic solutions that are simple, but mechanistic solutions that are actually quite complex. And as that takes place and populations arrive to an optimum, well, as natural selection does, for the most part, it removes the variability. And when you get to that optimum, like in the uh, mountain on the left, uh, if the population is at the very top, well, I mean, it has most likely extinguished all of the variability to get to that optimum. And I guess uh, there's some fragility in terms of like um, changes in the environment or changes that might actually uh, challenge the population with respect to the traits that in the first place took it there. So overall, I mean, adaptation is imperfect. Adaptation is not natural selection. And there are many problems that actually uh, might make it difficult for a population not only to persist and subsist, but also to achieve more, uh, better solutions. One extreme example of that is uh, it's antibiotic resistance. It's just like one step, you sometimes get a mutation and boom, you are up there at the optimum, right? But to be honest, like what we have seen so far is that is rare. Um, for eukaryotes, uh, for the most part, there are multiple walks to get to the optimum and many of them include many different genes contributing to those solutions at the trade level. So it's complex to now start thinking, oh, how are we going to predict whether a population, let's say on the right, and that black line that is stuck in the middle of the mountain, can actually make it up, right? So it's a little bit more complex, the question now. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that we want to harness in the center is actually study traits and populations that we know have evolved some adaptations that are currently experiencing some selection. And the reason for this is that we want to actually ask how has nature solved some problems or has partially solved some problems and understand whether there are some rules about the way those solutions come about. And uh, the simplest way to understand natural selection in the wild is just to find correlations between phenotypic traits and environmental variables. Yet, something more strong uh, and stronger would be not to only find that correlation, but actually finding it multiple times independently arising in different clades or independently arising across different habitats. And uh, here's an example that just to illustrate that, let's say that on the right you have this surface that we're going to assume that the pigs populations that are adapted to combinations of leaf mass, age of the leaf and uh, amount of water uh, over the year. And uh, those three ovals represent three stages, uh, phenotypic stages. And when you look on the left, uh, the history of those populations, you might see that, for example, the light green is in one part of the phylogeny and in another part of the phylogeny suggesting that that solution might have evolved independently twice. So if we can ask how did that happen, well, we know that we're actually capturing deterministic processes in evolution. However, if we take the blue, the light blue, which is really close to one another in the phylogenetic history, most likely we might not be capturing uh, independent instances, but just um, correlation due to ancestry. They are just really related to one another, as I am to my brother, so we're actually sharing a lot of our genetics. So this is the same. These two populations will be sharing the same. So, and the correlation with the environment that they might have effectively is an N of one. So it's very difficult to actually uh, infer very well from that. So ultimately, the reason we want these stages and, uh, in the, and multiple replicates of them is because we want to know how do we traverse uh, that uh, fitness landscape, right? And um, 
to do that, we need to know the traits. And to know the traits, we need to study them incredibly well, not only alone, but in combination. And we need to know how they change or affect performance across the environment. And here's where a lot of the aspects of conservation biology and agriculture intersect with uh, evolutionary biology and ecology. And of course, there are aspects of it that might not be directly necessary right away, both in agriculture and conservation biology, but ultimately the overlap is only going to enrich uh, the decision-making process that we take over time. Now, these trajectories that we look over time, um, of course, I mean, uh, evolutionary forces drive them, right? So we need to draw upon fundamental principles of ecology and evolution to un possibly understand and predict these shifts in uh, system stage uh, between one population and another population, for example. And that we cannot do it only by replicating what happens in nature because it just takes too long. So we need to actually bring in a lot of tools from uh, mathematical modeling. And uh, therefore, the solution that we think is to combine uh, bio biology, fundamental biology with uh, fundamental mathematics to provide these uh, ways of thinking as to how the whole system uh, can change over time and whether those changes over time are possibly improving whatever aspect of the plan that we're interested in. All right, so just a quick example. It won't take too long as the way we're approaching this in uh, a plant system uh, that I have developed here in uh, Australia called the initial lotto system. And um, the idea is very simple to illustrate it. We have a trade correlation that which, which is quite neat. So when you look at uh, the Sasteraceae uh, along the coast and you look at it on the sand dunes, they are tall plants. But if you look at them on the nearby headland, they are short plants, they are prostrate. And if you keep looking at more dune and headlands, dune and headlands, well, the correlation only gets stronger. You actually always see tall and short, tall and short in the two environments. So that suggests that there might be some relationship to natural selection here, but what really gives it away is that they have originally in the, or originated independently multiple times. In green, you have the headland, in dune, you have the, in, in orange, you have the dune, and you can see they are interspersed. It's just like all orange in one side of the phylogeny and all green in the other side of the phylogeny. So we know that there are at least eight to nine independent iterations or what we can say like natural replicates of this process. So we can actually ask how has nature solved the problem or arrived close to the problem in these multiple times. So ultimately we have a case of evolution of natural selection uh, from which we want to take advantage to study the traits that follow and produced uh, that solution. So one of the fundamental questions that we ask therefore is well, what is common to each pair? Let's say if, if we have a uh, at the top, H2D3 with the asterisks, that's one pair. You just keep looking down, there's D4H5, and there are other D14H15, and you can ask, okay, what is common to the way the H2, H5, and H15 came about, right? And what happens is that if you look at one gene at a time, well, you don't find anything really, very, 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 very little. And this is surprising because it suggests that many of the solutions that might be following uh, these trajectories of becoming prostrate on the headland, for example, might not be very constrained, right? Or maybe they're constrained at different levels. So when we actually say, okay, what happens to all the gene components, all the genetics in that genomes of the different population pairs, what you start seeing in common is that they have some functions in common, right? So this is a very busy slide. I don't want you to look at it in detail. Just think about the, the, the top, um, Title oxin pathway, that's a pathway that controls growth and development in plants. And you can see different parts of the pathway. You can create oxin through biosynthesis. You can do conjugation to make it in or out of the cell more easily, or you can take it inside the cell, outside the cell towards transport and so on and so forth. So what we found is that, let's say that transport is actually recruited in all the population pairs, but not the same genes of transport. Right, so when you think of one gene at a time, that makes sense. It's not the same gene used, but it's a gene that creates and that uses an equivalent function. So that's more or less like the, the idea that is happening here. So to summarize, how we uh, rationalize this is that we have looking at ecotypic differences. We have a top-down approach, which is called. And then by looking at those ecotypic differences, we find the hypothesis that some pathways might be divergent. And then if that auxin is divergent, then we say, okay, we make some predictions about what traits should be differentiated in those populations. And then once we know those traits, 
then we can study their trajectories. An example of such trait is how the plant perceives gravity. So at the bottom, you can see one plant on its side that actually went up and another plant on its side on the right that actually remains straight. So the one on the left perceives changes in the gravity vector, but the one on the right doesn't. And we know that this is an oxygen related trait. So what we do is basically confirm this correlation with the environment as well. And we actually ask if it's evolving by natural selection and we do transplant experiments, selection experiments in the field to actually demonstrate that this actual trait is evolving by natural selection. Now, when we look at uh, these oxygen functions across the, um, the genomes of these different plants that have a strong response to gravity versus not a strong to gravity, we find exactly the same that we started to hypothesize at the beginning. Certain aspects of the oxygen pathway he highlight, here highlighted with darker color uh, are actually repeatedly recruited across population pairs. In other words, the way to become prostrate seems to be equivalent, not the same, but equivalent. And this equivalent is quite important because it gives insight as to how plants, in this case, are adapting to new environments. And uh, one of the issues that we need to uh, disentangle is that oxygen being a hormone is highly pleiotropic, or in other words, is a hormone that has effects in more than one trait. As I said, it might affect the tropism, like responding to light, the tropism, responding to gravity, but also is uh, involved in many other aspects of the plant development. So we need to say, oh, well, yeah, these pathways are diverging between populations, but how do we nail the actual trait, the shapes and the functions that are controlled by this oxygen that actually led to adaptation? So here's where genetics comes in. And um, I'm not gonna go into details. I'm happy to talk to anyone afterwards. But what we do is basically break all the correlations among traits that accumulated historically in each dune population or in each headland population, right? The dune and the headland are different in so many different things, not only in their ability to respond to salt, but also in their ability to respond to drought, also in their ability to produce certain secondary chemicals to react against insects. Right? And they're accumulating those differences. So what we do is we jumble them up. We basically like mix all of those differences into one single blended uh, population, we, which we call a recombinant population. And then in, in that population, we can sort them according to any trait. So here it's one sorting in that frequency distribution where I have sorted the populations by their ability to respond to gravity or not. And of course, I mean, we know that the dune can respond to gravity, the headland can respond to gravity. And when we jumbled it up, now we're actually pulling apart those traits in this association from other such traits that might be, have been different between the population. So we do that and we combine it with the idea of these natural populations. And then we're gonna basically narrow down all the differences that uh, are accumulating in this system, in the oxygen pathway, for example, what of it is actually responsible for the evolution of a particular trait? And uh, we can do this uh, uh, sequencing genomes, both in the recombinant populations and the natural populations. I'm not gonna go into detail here, but we have ways to actually uh, separate the, uh, the wheat from the chaff and try to identify those noisy signals of the system versus those specific signals of the system that might contribute to adaptation. And that one leads us to build models of how the plan might be working, which lead us to then test uh, physiological models or developmental models while keeping in, in account the variability of the system, which is basically what we're trying to harness all the time. So imagine that we have then a system where we have an idea of what traits are adaptive, that trait has evolved multiple times. We know that the solutions to that problem is very varied. In other words, you're gonna make a pie, but there are many recipes for the pie, and it still is an apple pie. So we're trying to figure out those ingredients, but we're doing it backwards. We look at the pie first, and then we try to rewrite the recipe. So when we do that, we ne definitely need to do genetics, as I was just mentioning before. And this is one of the main questions that we're trying to answer in my laboratory and through the center, which is what is the genetic basis of adaptive trait evolution? But as I said before, how similar it is across replicates. So how many recipes for the pie there are? But the most important thing is like, can I switch between recipes? If I gave you one pie with a recipe and said, okay, can you actually predict even these changes in sugar and flour? What, how is the next pie gonna look like? 
Well, that's a much complicated uh, problem to solve. And for that, we need a lot of computational biology processes. And what, to do these modelings of shifts between adaptive solutions, as we remember on the mountains, how you can go up in different ways, we need to basically model these shifts while considering the system as a whole. And this, and this is where the center makes its mark in which we're gonna try to look at the whole system uh, and the interaction among the components of the system as opposed to looking at one gene at a time. So on the left here, we have all those multiple trajectories and they might be equivalent, but some of them might get stuck, others might not get stuck, others might be better than others, but all of them point towards a certain type of optimum. We would like to actually be able to model that, but not only that, the one on the right, it might be stuck. How can we actually shift it so it actually joins a green trajectory or a red trajectory. So overall, this allows us to basically put together aspects of ecology, genetics, evolution, and classical quantitative genetics into a single framework to, that help us model systems uh, in time and space. And with that one, we can basically uh, create uh, mathematical models and computational experiments in which we can integrate uh, genetic architectures, or in this case, networks, as the one that Christine showed, in evolved populations that allow us to create surrogate models that can then be used to predict the input from genetics to the output in terms of like how the system looks like. And then in the surrogate models, we have mathematicians working on helping us create such models, but also discrete mathematicians helping us to understand the not only comparing how these network systems differ to one another, but also how we can actually navigate uh, the network space uh, seemingly. seemingly so ultimately we want to modify the input and either computationally or uh, experimentally to be able to predict better those outputs and ideally to move along these adaptive landscapes, right? We finally can use experimental evolution in which we can do evolution in the field in which we can put our predicted um, input modifications in the field to see whether we can predict the output. In other words, can we replicate the predicted movements along the adaptive landscape? And we can also do that in the glass house. We can actually pull them apart according to certain rules that we're discovering, and we can actually see how good our ability to predict movements across landscapes really is. So overall, I mean, the message is that Understanding how populations adapt to the environment, particularly when you can harness traits that definitely show an uh, indi indication of uh, being driven by natural selection can reveal how these complex solutions come about. And for that one, you need a, com a combination of uh, ecology, genetics, evolution, and definitely mathematics as the common uh, knowledge that actually brings it all together. Right. So with that one, I'm going to stop because I know that now Ian has to speak and I don't want to take much of more of his time. So Ian, off to you now. Okay. Thanks, Daniel. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. So can you see that? All okay. Um, can, you see, can you see that all right? Yep. Yes. Not, not okay, the cool. full screen, but yeah, now we can. Okay, okay cool. So, um, Thanks, Daniel. That was, that was great. So a uh, bit of a change of direction now, or just change of pace, I guess. Um, Sorry. Uh, okay. So yeah, I'm, a, I'm at Macquarie Uni. I'm a plant functional ecologist, which means I'm interested in the relationships of plant form and function. These are very kind of classical questions in, in plant biology and uh, particularly interested in, in plant functional traits and how they help us understand variation in what we call plant ecological strategies or the way that plants do their business. So uh, in, in my lab, uh, we work at a variety of scales from doing global data analyses and, and syntheses to fine scale kind of physiological work in labs and glass houses. Um, a lot of my current work is um, a, a long running interest of mine, which is developing optimality theory for trying to understand or trying to predict how, uh, how plants should operate in, in different uh, situations and then testing that with, with uh, field data and then improving models and so forth. So it's a sort of a strong inference type of approach to science. Um, and a lot of the work is also relates to improving vegetation models. So that's been sort of my main, uh, my main thrust of, of research for the last 10 or 20 years. But uh, I suppose in the last couple of years, I've been more and more interested in trying to build bridges with uh, people doing omics research to try and uh, build a new style of understanding of, of plant function. Because I really think that's where there's, uh, there's huge potential. So particularly trying to build across this, this sort of uh, the, what were divides between omics researchers and physiology and ecology and evolution. Um, 
and, uh, and to apply this in, in wild crops and, uh, and diverse lineages. So I'm just going to uh, just briefly kind of mention two projects that are just starting up, which are related to this theme of, of building bridges between omics and ecology. One of them, um, and there's a bit of overlap between the projects, but the one, one project is, a, is we'll be focusing on native rangeland grasses. And this is a, a project with an east-west trajectory or transect of collaborators from Sydney to Canberra to Adelaide and, and UWA, where we'll be looking at uh, rangeland grasses and particular grasses such as kangaroo grass, which are so widespread and so iconic. Um, kangaroo grass occurs across the whole continent of Australia and indeed other places as well. And so there we'll be uh, identifying interesting populations and genotypes and trying to understand the links between the, the genes and the physiology and also the, the proteome. <clears throat> in a project like that, we're interested in building new narratives about the evolution and biogeography of, of uh, kangaroo grass and, and other, as I said, other range of grasses. And I think there'll be kind of clear uh, links to conservation biology. Um, but the, the one course we're really talking about today is this, the, the Centre of Excellence. And so that's on a north-south north, uh, transect of collaborators with the, the universities involved at UTAS, Monash, uh, Macquarie, UQ and QUT. <clears throat> so um, well, Christine and, and Daniel have already done a, a wonderful job of introducing um, what, we're, what we're really kind of planning to do in that work. Um, and uh, so I thought I'd just kind of give a a very um, non-technical sort of example of the sorts of things we'd, we'd be trying to do. So if, if, as a plant biologist and an ecophysiologist, <clears throat> I'm, I'm aware that over many decades, we have built sort of general narratives about a whole lot of general ways that plants can cope with aridity. So this isn't true of every species, <clears throat> but if you go on average to a, a low rainfall situation, <clears throat> many of the species have thicker leaves. This is built of a thicker mesophyll layers, uh, they, they, they pile up more layers of the nitrogen-rich mesophyll, which allows them to draw the, the, um, the CO2 down to lower concentrations during photosynthesis. There's a lower CICA ratio <coughs> and improves their water use efficiency. Um, they typically operate at a lower stomatal conductance, so they use less water during photosynthesis. And all these leaf level, level changes, which we can often we understand using optimality theory, are also coordinated with other parts of the whole um, body plan. So uh, typically the, the leaves are <clears throat> engineered in such a way and their chemistry allows them to operate at very uh, negative water potentials without wilting. <clears throat> the, uh, the sapwood, uh, the hydraulic system in the sapwood is engineered in such a way that the narrow, the vessels are very narrow and this gives them a, um, a very uh, strong resistances to the negative water potentials that occur in these, these systems throughout the hydraulic system. The trade-off there is a safety efficiency trade-off that the, the, the more safe you make the hydraulic system, uh, the less efficient it is, or at least the slower the rate of water flow. And this means that plants in these systems can also have to, have to operate deploying less total leaf area per branch than, than other, other species in, in other systems. Uh, the, the smaller canopy, uh, total canopy uh, layout is uh, coordinated with generally building smaller leaves and this relates to the en energy balance considerations of leaves as well. Smaller leaves, all else equal, are less likely to overheat under a given uh, radiation stream and wind speed and so forth. So I'm, in sort of, I'm sort of just kind of throwing out all these, uh, these pieces of knowledge here and we tackle all these in different ways. Um, I can think of like at least four different bodies of uh, optimality theory and ecophysiology and ecology and evolution that tackle all these, have, have tackled all these uh, uh, questions from different perspectives, but never really all within one framework. So a challenge for us, for us is to try and build uh, a new style of, of models, uh, conceptual models, mechanistic models, um, and also uh, empirical uh, phenomenological models which uh, represent these traits and adaptations as networks. So as, as an example of a model that's a bit too, perhaps too simple is a, is a standard sort of hydraulic architectural model as used in an ecosystem demography um, framework, where we think about uh, the, the fluxes and pools of, of water through, through the different parts of a, of, a, of a plant system. And then a very detailed sort of phenomenological model for, in this case, plant adaptations to light is that one shown on the right. It just shows, it's a, a network diagram showing the way that a whole bunch of different types of traits are all coordinated with, another, with one another. And also you can, can, within that whole network, you can um, perceive different sort of units, functional units within them. So a challenge of what, what we'll be doing is trying to build sort of an intermediate level of complexity here 
that uh, is right, you know, is kind of fit for our purpose. Um, fit for our purpose of trying to understand the way that plants uh, um, and a diverse range of plants, so not just say trees, but also grasses and, and crops, uh, coordinate uh, the um, differences in the hydraulic architecture in the architecture, uh, in the hydraulic architecture, in the physical architecture, and in the, the costs of the, the different parts of the plant and the functions. So, as, so uh, as I said, we're interested in working in uh, not just crops and not just crop wild relatives uh, and not just trees, for example, but sort of uh, fanning our, our sampling efforts out across the, um, the plant phylogeny. And, uh, and obviously this is a, a pretty ambitious enterprise, uh, but we think we're the you know, right team to be doing it. Um, I guess a, a really important part of this is actually is species selection uh, designs and, and really thinking very hard through the, the best way to, to sample widely. Um, so taking me right out of my comfort zone, we'll likely be working on uh, genera such as sorghum. So I've spent my entire professional life more or less ignoring grasses and kind of thinking about the woody component of vegetation. But uh, as an example, um, if we think about a genus such as sorghum, which has quite a strong representation in the Australian flora, uh, and uh, of course sorghum is a major a food crop across the world. Uh, here's, here's some distribution uh, point data taken from ALA, which shows for, what is that, 13 different species of sorghum, uh, their, their uh, distribution. And you can, without even seeing the, the climate overlaid on this, I'm sure you know that, uh, that there's a huge variation here, particularly in uh, rainfall and seasonality across these different populations. So an interesting question would be to think in a group such as sorghum is how have they, um, how have they coped uh, through evolutionary time in developing different ways to be successful in these different environments. So, um, so at Macquarie, there's a few of us involved in the centre. I'm the sole CI, but I have uh, three or four associate investigators. And one uh, uh, AI is, is Rachel, Rachel Gallagher, who some of you probably know. And so we work sort of on a routine basis with uh, plant distribution data in various projects. We have uh, you know, the herbarium occurrence data for 22,000 plant species that's publicly available, but we've gone through and painstakingly uh, cleaned that all up. We have uh, we've run it through uh, SDMs, uh, niche models to try and estimate our best guess, uh, uh, continuous range probability for all, for all most of the species that we can. We also have uh, resources such as Oztraits, this big new trait database is just about to come online. And so with uh, data resources such as these um, and twinned with good phylogenies, uh, we'll be thinking hard through which species to study and which populations to sample and so forth. So what I thought would be just worth sort of noting here is that uh, there are clear links between our style of work and two conservation biology questions. Uh, that's not really, uh, it's not a main part of the centre's um, uh, uh, goal, but a, a main part of our goal is to build links externally and, and outwardly, and particularly to groups such as yours. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in, in uh, the sorts of questions that are on your mind. Um, but uh, the sorts of obvious things we can ask is, you know, which species are predicted to have significant range losses under future climate change? And how does this relate to our, our new style of understanding um, built on mechanism and on, on genes? Should we be focusing on, dem on endemic species? What about wild crop relatives? Uh, should we be focusing on key species from uh, threatened community types? And could this help guide conservation decisions? And so I'll finish with that really, and just and, uh, and, and challenge you, I hope, to, uh, to think through this over the next few years and think if there could be interesting synergies between the style of research we'll be doing uh, at Macquarie uh, and through the rest of the center uh, with your own work on conservation biology. So thanks very much.